Great to have your company on another episode of Willow Talk. Adam Peacock alongside Brad Haddon. Hads, how are things? Mate, they're good. Uh, yeah. I'm excited about this this guest today. Wholehearted uh, cricketer. I, I can't wait to talk to him. You, and, got, and you got one big question. Today. I've got one big Just question. Just save it for a yeah, sec before I introduce it. him. Uh, Paul Blocker-Wilson is our special guest today on Willow Talk. Uh, cricketer, umpire, top bloke. Anything else you'd like to add to that one, Blocker? <laughs> Oh, it's, it's your show. You can have whatever you like. Yeah. But thanks for having me, lads. How are you going? Good, thank you. Hads, take it away. What's your question? Blocker, first and foremost, you've spent your career terrorising umpires. Why? <laughs> yes. Why did you go into it? Uh, Patrick can turn games, Cooper, yeah. Um, it was something, <laughs> I just th- something I thought about towards the end, actually, in my career. I, I remember having a conversation with Daryl Harper, of all people, uh, a couple of years before I finished playing cricket, that, um, he, he thought there should be more encouragement, if you like, for former players to take it up. And funnily enough, Paul Rifle and Rod Tucker took it up, I think, a year later. And, and then uh, once I'd finished, I doubled in coaching for a couple of years. And it was always something I thought about, so I took it on. So maybe a bit of madness, mate. Maybe it was something in there I thought that, <laughs> why, why, why don't we have ex-players in Australia do it like they do in England? It's just part of the culture in England, but we just don't do it uh, in Australia. So I followed the lead of, of Pistol and Rod, and here we are. Yep. So I'm 18 years later. So this all sounds familiar, like a, a, a playing career that you loved and then gave it away and then dabbled in a bit of coaching and then found umpiring. Hads, is it in your future? <laughs> I'm not as patient as Blocker. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so. I, I tell you what, I, I do enjoy it with, with the under 12s. Yeah. Uh, and, and on one, I don't give wides or no balls. It, it, you find kids these days, the ball comes in their bottom, they move and look at you. And I say, you could have hit that. Hang on. What if it bounces three times down the side? Mate, they can step Off and the hit pitch. it. They can step and hit it. Okay. Fair You've enough. you encourage um, positive play, don't you, Block? Well, you do. And I, I'm going to say, I, I did a game for my... My daughter was playing stage two last year. Ads. Um, yep. And we're playing right out in the Hunter Valley somewhere. It was quite hot. It was about 35 degrees, 8 o'clock in the morning. So we're just about at that time zone that we actually call this thing off. But I actually helped out where I did one innings of that game as an umpire. And it's the only game in 18 years that a player did not argue or ask any questions about any decisions. <laughs> my, my wife my wife was the manager of the side. She said, how did that go? She said, I will do that every week of the rest of my life because no one argued at all. No one asked me a question. They just got on with it. It was fantastic, mate. Awesome. I'll I tell you why I'll be no good. A couple of years ago, I, I was un- umpiring my, my oldest boy's cricket game and, and and I'm the parent that sits over the other side so stays away from the cricket I'll help without in all other sports and they needed an umpire and it was their first game on turf mm. and, and I remember looking at the wicket and I said to the, the other umpire I said we've got to be really careful not to give LBs here today I said it's a low wicket I said these kids aren't used to it. this game could be over in 15 minutes anyway the opening batter walks out and he skipped out to bat and he goes this is the most exciting day of my life and I said, oh, that's good. He said, my uncle's told me about how it is on turf. My pop's told me, my father, first ball, Nick. <laughs> and I thought, I can't give him out. I can't give him out. Anyway, not out. The, the uh, bowler said to me, did you hear something? I said, did you think it was his pad? And he goes, it, it could have been. And his bat and pad were that far away. <laughs> I, I didn't have the heart to, to give him out. Next ball, he hit a four. And I thought, oh, no, I, I've ruined it. He, next ball, he got bowled. So it was all happy. But... I didn't have in my heart to give him out. He, he was that excited. <laughs> Imagine if I had to give him out first ball yeah. he ever played on turf. So it's, I wouldn't be any good block. There you go. Yeah. There you Unfortunately, go. Um, Cameron, Cam- Cameron Bancroft didn't get that yesterday at the Wacker I see. That was the first ball of the match. Uh, and young yeah. Jaden Goodwin actually got a cop to first baller as well. Murray's young fella. I saw two for yeah. none after two balls and a shield game. That was just ridiculous. Amazing. That was just too good, Michael Nisa, that was. That was uh, mm. elite bowling. Um, Blocker, before we get into the umpiring stuff, we've also later in the show, we've got questions from the Secret Cricket Club, which comes through our Instagram page. All the punters mm. out there have got plenty of questions, the, the regular ones as well. So, um, And then some irregular ones too, potentially <laughs> for myself and Had. But <laughs> right that's Excellent. the umpiring, which is to come. But it, you, your playing career as well, and it was at a fascinating time for Australian cricket um, because you, you had – it, it felt like there was an incredible amount of depth. It was the mid nineties when you, you came through onto the international scene, but your first class debut for South Australia, not a bad first poll, Matthew Hayden. 
Did you give him a send off, Hados, who'd made his uh, test debut at this stage? Yeah, he probably wasn't the personality or the, the type of person you give a send off to, Big Doss. Um, no. Story goes, I played him in a second lemon game playing for the academy before that particular fixture, and I did actually give him a serve. I actually said, Is this the best Queensland can offer? After he nicked me through the slips a few times and down, <laughs> and then being the idiot that I am from the country, you know, getting 150, and I thought he probably is the best Queensland has got to offer. So I take, all, I take all the credit. I take all the credit for how good he is. Um, so he was the best Queensland I had to offer. So no, I didn't give him a send off. I was pretty happy to get that wicket. Um, it's crazy. You start looking through some of the score sheets and some of the stuff that comes on socials and YouTube, yeah. et cetera, heads, and some of these teams that. You just played the game, and now you look back and see some of the teams you played in and against. You do, you can't, you sort of scratch your head and pinch yourself. And um, the Queensland side was amazing that game. I think we had McDermott, Border, just to name a couple. Um, so heroes of mine, particularly Billy McDermott, hey, Alan Border, everyone's hero. Um, yeah, so Andy Bickle and Kastowitz and yeah, Matthew Hayden, Stuart Law. Um, yeah, just yeah, it was a pretty phenomenal way to come into cricket, um, you wouldn't have it any other way. But the sides and the cricket teams, Adam, that we played against and with in those days, um, yeah, they were just phenomenal teams. Um, quite lucky, actually, to have played in that era, to be honest. So, um, you know, I, I don't have any um, any regrets being part of that uh, sort of 90s and early O's. Hmm. Talking about those wonderful teams, Blocky, you actually played the Australian A series against Australia when the whole of the Australians were going for the, the Australian A team, not the Aussie. Yeah, it was. Uh, 97, 98, we uh, played a game with the SCG. Um, and as you know, as a, an old keeper, is that we had the, we had the change. Yeah. We had the change of a Healy played for us in the Australian A, and yeah. Healy played for the Australian team. And can you picture this? He's a guy from northern New South Wales, born and bred, getting booed at the SCG. <laughs> Um, yeah. because he's replaced the, the, the legend in Ian Healy. Um, and that went on for the whole, because I actually came into the side for the domestic, it's not the domestic, the international one day series after that. And he got booed pretty much anywhere he went, Gilly, for the entire series. It's quite quite amazing when you think back of that. But yeah, that was um exciting era. It was a pretty good side, the one we had, and certainly the Australian side was uh, even slightly better. You, you look at some of the guys that you had to, to bowl against at first class level and and also international level when you were playing Australia A and Australia and, and dancing between the two lineups. Like I, I look at your first ever, your, your one day debut. So how's this for top order? Michael DiVenuto, uh, Mark War, Ricky Ponting, Steve War, Michael Bevan, Adam Gilchrist, and then Chucky Nee and Harvey, and then a, a bloke called Shane Warne too, who, who could bat a bit as well. But that top six, like kind of coexisting and net sessions and all of those things, what did that do to you as a cricketer? Uh, it's it would just pinch yourself. Um, as a kid, you came from you know a sort of regional Australia to come to slip in, and after only sort of half a dozen ten first class games, to be sitting amongst those players you just mentioned, I, I, you, you can't quite believe it even now, uh, to be honest. And when you're living out here, Mark Wall was around the place. He opened with Adam Gilchrist. It's when Jeff Marsh actually brought that partnership together in the final series of the Triangular series that year. That was the first time they came together. Yep. Um, so you sort of was interesting as well, Adam. You're part of a trans, was a transition from just picking a team to all of a sudden we're picking a different team for one day cricket versus test cricket. And I was actually part of that uh, start of that era, if you like. I wasn't good enough to stay in that side. Let's be frank. I mean, there's probably a dozen bowls in front of me. I was just happened to be in the right place at the right time. There were a few injuries at the time, and I got my chance. I was a half decent white ball bowler, so that's the reason why I got there. But yeah, it was a really pinch yourself, mate, to be to be amongst those, uh, what we now call legends of the game. One of our staple questions here on Willow Talk, um, especially to batters, is who's the worst to face in the net? So I'm going to reverse it here and say, who was your bunny out of that lot in the nets, if there was one, and who absolutely gave it to you, just murdered whatever you threw at them in the nets and <laughs> there was no way through? Um, I reckon the person, I think most bowlers would say Adam Gilchrist uh, in the nets. I mean, what you saw in the, on the game versus what you saw in the nets could often be very different. Um, I think for me, left-handers, any left-hander came in most of the time, I, I'd have a pretty good record against in the nets. Just the fact that the angle and uh, the wide of the crease and you know, what I was able to do with the ball, um, that was an advantage to me. Right, in terms of the right-handers, anyone that's had fun with me, well, Mark War is probably one of those. Um, uh, Ricky Ponting at his peak. I mean, when he's on song in the nets, he could do what you like. Uh, hit you to wherever he wants to hit you. So, 
No, he would be one, probably those two, probably straight up. <laughs> but I could probably list you about a, 10 batters, Adam, if you like, who were really good against me in the Nets. I wasn't that good. So um, I, that's why it was so good because they got so many runs because I'd gotten them into form. So uh, I was a very good ally to have. <laughs> You've been a bit harsh on yourself there, Block. Um, was it intimidating walking into that Australian team? Yeah, it was. Um, it was, but the beauty was uh, Steve Wolf, Shane Warren types. Um, Tugger is captain as he was then. It was just to be named as captain yep. as a one-day side. He had this great ability, I think, with people who came into the side uh, to always say to you that as far as they're concerned, as you've been selected, uh, just back yourself and go and do what you do. I think that anybody, whether you've been playing for a year, five years, 10 years, trying to get out of the Australian side, if the captain of the side and, you know, and also the, the obviously the greatest player we've seen in Shane Warne say that to you is that they, they back you in no matter what. It just gives that element of confidence that, you know, I belong here, even though it was briefly for some of us like me. But it just gave you that confidence. But, yeah, it's very, very intimidating to walk in that room. It's There are players there that you honestly looked up to and were heroes of, of yourself. Mm. Did you find it hard to relate when you walked in, Hats, to the to the legends, that the dressing room that you walked into? And you, you've told that story a few times about when you went as a as the backup to Gilly in 2001 and you watched how intense Test cricket was and go, I'm not ready for this, so go back to state cricket. But just, you know around the meal room, in on the bus? Like, is there an intimidation factor? Yeah, 100%. I think the intimidation factor comes from how high regard you, you held that Australian team. That that, that team, when, when Blocker came into and, and I came in to, to later, that that's generationally one of the best Australian teams we've, we've ever seen. The, the lucky thing I had is when you got your blue cap, you got your green cap as well. Yeah, so, much so. A, a, yeah. a lot of those guys played... <laughs> <laughs> for, for New South Wales as well. Or but if you're born it, it, in New it South Wales. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, you, well, you get your green cap straight away. But I, I did. I, I've said to you before, I, I remember being in India at a game at Calcutta and I was on standby. And the, the hype around the ground and how quick everything was happening, sitting there going, oh, I'm not ready for this yet. I, I'm not ready for international cricket. I, I don't know if you ever had that feeling, Blocker, when you, your first games for Australia thinking, Hang on a minute. A- am I ready for this stage? That's yes. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> there's no doubt about it. It, it, it. Just to add to your point is that the, the advantage we had was with the academy system. Uh, so to, to paint your picture, uh, people like uh, McGrath, uh, Ponting, Gilchrist, which is not a bad trio to start with, I, I went through the academy with those guys. Um, so it was quite an advantage when I walked into change rooms. I had people I knew really well from the start. I knew some of these players before they even played first class cricket. So that was an event. What were they for like me. as uh sorry, uh, Bob, what were they like as young men? Any different to what they were as um you know, as I their think, careers went on? Punner's well Thirsty. documented. Um but he was sensationally good at sixteen as he was when he all the way through you could just tell at sixteen, seventeen how good he was gonna be. It was just phenomenal. He was a he was a person you could just see, you could see the game in advance um more than anybody else. Uh, I remember when he came to the Nets in Adelaide, the indoor Nets there, had at Adelaide Oval with and back as Rod Marsh. Yeah. Had us all bowling the punter and um, he was just pulling us for fun off his nose. And as a 16, 17 year old, we thought, wow, we had Kastrowitz, myself, other guys who were far better than me. And he was just making fun. Um, McGrath was just a you know, company lad from Narromine that had just been in Sydney for a couple of years. And uh, he was just a typical country guy that loved going out in the country and um, and coming back and playing cricket is no different. He hasn't changed a bit. And Gilly's the same. A uh, guy I first met when I was playing for Newcastle under 19s and he was playing for Sydney. Uh, so we'd known each other since we were 18 years of age and he's not changed a bit. He's the same guy. And it's a credit to all three. They're not really changed at all. They're just they're good human beings. But uh, the other part is the sensation of cricketers as well. So they have to... You know, we toured South Africa in 92 with the academy. And those three guys were in that side along with Peter McIntyre and Murray Goodwin and... You look at that academy side of '92 that toured South Africa was just sensational. Uh, just the fact that we we're mm. part of it was uh, was great fun. Like I take you back to 1998, Eden Park at Testabu, Eden Garden, Eden. Oh, sorry, Eden Garden. So he, he can't mm. get Kiwis off the like brain. It. Don't like Kiwis. That's, that's, that's um, the thing. It's forefront of his <laughs> mind. Just, how am I going to stuff up a Kiwi today? Yeah, true. But anyway, carry on. India was a different place to to tour back then. Uh, it was. Um, I had I had the fortune, if you call it, to be go. I went there in '92 with what was called the Gastetner Pace Bowling Scholarship Program, um, 
Basil Sellers program way back then in the early 90s. Wow. So I went there in 92 when it was really a challenge to tour uh, India. So we only oh, stayed in, it was the Madras Rubber Factory Pace Academy there in Madras, which is now Chennai. So I was there in 92. So at least I had a little bit of idea what I was in for. Uh, and 98, it started, you could start to see, we started to turn, they were becoming more of the radio, everything like the infrastructure was getting better and the food you're eating was getting better, et cetera, particularly the good hotels. But um, yeah, it's, as you know, it's a challenge no matter where you go. And it's more or less the places, the outposts, not the major cities, but the, the outposts in, inside the country become a challenge. But yeah, it's one hell of a tour. I mean, it's, well, what, what it's just the passion for cricket, um, the passion for life. Um, they're yeah, a great experience. And I've been there a few times since in my umpiring life. You're unlucky in that test match, Australia. Um, India snuck home by an innings and 219 <laughs> runs. Yes. Five no, for 633 <laughs> blocker. Yeah. India, five for 633. What do you remember about that? Just watching just red ball after red ball go past you and... Yeah. Uh, what do I remember? Well, firstly, for me, unfortunately, I got injured in that game. So it was my only test match. So I, did a, I did a groin in that game, unfortunately. So um, that Smart wasn't very helpful to, to, to Tubby Taylor. So he always reminds me of that every time I see him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Warnie keep asking, where's Blocker? I need him now. Um, what do I know? Just the crowd, the, crowd, the noise. Um, to have your one test in Calcutta, just a place like Calcutta, it's a, it's an iconic venue. Um, was brilliant. Yeah. I do remember that was the uh, one. So here's my umpiring hat on. It was one neutral, one home umpire in that series. That was the era of the one and one. Uh, fair to say, we also had a guy called Sarah Ganguly uh, playing on that side. He was the captain of the team, um, <laughs> and we didn't realise at the time we're doing that. You can't give him out at Eden Gardens. Um, so I think he might have got over a hundred. You probably got the. You probably may have the, the game there in front of you, but I think he we oh, called yeah. it. He yeah. got six for one hundred and fifty in that game batting. Uh, so <laughs> and then he, came he got out, sixty five, sir. Um, Muhammad yes. Azaruddin, yes, uh, so, who was um, named something mm. else by Billy Birmingham, one hundred and sixty three not. Yeah, Muhammad, so didn't get him. He, he didn't have a dodgy fast either. So we're never quite sure what happened in that game either. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so that were two things. Um, and then Sarah came out to bowl and Sarah got four wickets and a great mate of all of ours, Gavin Robertson, uh, was batting, I think yeah. at the end when I came into bat and he got out LBW and I swear to you, it hit him outside the line of leg stump and going further down leg side. That was his fourth <laughs> wicket of the four. So I, I, I did realize at that stage that we might be up against it, lads, um, in that particular <laughs> test match. So, <laughs> And by the way, the guy who was the man of the match, uh, who did remind me of this last year in my last international game as an umpire, was Javigal Srinath. Um, yes, Jav, I think, yep. was the man of the match that particular game. So he he tore us apart, I believe, in the first inning. He took a few early and just set us back on our heels, and that was it. So he was one hell of a bowler, Jav, when you think about that era in the, in the spinners, etc. cetera. Javigal Srinath's um, record uh, across the world, particularly at home in India, is sensational. So he was actually player of the match. But... It went very quickly. It was all a blur, um, but obviously had the chance to play, which is I never thought I'd get. Uh, beheaded your cap. And then, um, yeah, I was on a plane back with my mate, Paul Rifle, after that test, both of us injured. Um, and a segue to that what? was the last international game as an umpire. I went back on a plane from Calcutta back to Australia with Paul Rifle again after the World Cup in 2023. <laughs> so it was bizarre how the world turns. So there you go. Is that where... Maybe the seed was planted in 1998. said, maybe there's a better way of doing this whole international cricket thing. Let's become umpires because these <laughs> blokes out in the middle that we've just oh, seen do well, not know what they are doing. The test before we had, uh, Mark Walsh probably told this story a thousand times, but the test match in Chennai, the, the first test, George Sharp from England was a neutral umpire. And being the, you know, we were 12th, 13th, 14th man in that series, so we tended to get down the bar and have a couple of bevies just to replace the fluids and keep <laughs> hydrated. And there was George on the last <laughs> night before the last day, and he was cooked. And I mean literally cooked um, with the heat. And yeah, everyone <laughs> thought, okay, this is interesting. Next day, I'm not joking here when I say this, at least four howlers went against us, the Australian team, the next day. And one was actually LB, uh, potting LBW. It actually hit the edge of his bat. bat uh, Ricky's bat turned, so the edge of the bat spawned at the umpire. They went up from the pearl for LBW, given out. It never touched the pad. 
Um, so when that happened, we definitely knew it was going to be a tough day. <laughs> I think Junior got caught a first slip off his shoe. It actually came straight off his boot, straight the first slip, and we were given our court first slip. So we thought, yeah, this might be a challenging day for the Vega Greens today. So, yeah, there you go. So maybe it was, mate. 98 might have been the turning point, mate. You might be right. This- this this is making a bit of sense. It's mm. like, a, you, you know, when you, and it's very admirable you've taken this path in life because some people will go, oh, yeah, stuff umpires, I hate them forever. And it goes, no, I'm going to make change and change for good. I'm going to become one of these people and make, do better than what they, I've seen. But just on, to wrap up your, your, um, your international career, did you, do you look at it and go, oh, I undersold myself a bit there. I should have got more out of it. Or what you look back on now and your record, you go, yeah. I'm bloody happy with that. Uh, playing record you're talking about? Oh, just the amount of international cricket you got to play. Uh, yeah, it's, it's right. I mean, I, I didn't think, I did, look, you look at that era, um, and I, I always pinch myself the fact we had a chance to play. So to get that bag of green for me was, the unlucky part was being injured in that game. I didn't think I'd play many more beyond that anyway, uh, the, based on the plays that were injured that didn't go and the ones that were coming through the system, like one Brett Lee, um, I wasn't going to compete with him. So there were some pretty good mm. players coming through. And I thought, you know what, I might get one, maybe two test matches at him, but that was it. So I think in a way, uh, the test career is it is what it is. Uh, potentially could have played a few more one days. That was that was my strong point as a bowler, to be quite frank. And I could have played a few more, but ultimately um, that era was so strong. As I said, I'm not joking. I would have been down the, the pecking order, really. When you look at the bowlers that were available, if they were fit and firing, they're not even remotely looking at me at all. I was just lucky with opportunity. You did a smart thing in 2002 as a fast bowler. You thought, ah, where can I go? Speaking of Brett Lee and, and Hads has told the horror stories of Brett Lee bowling at the Wacker. Where can I go where I can make it a bit easier for myself? And I'll bowl with the doctor um, at the Wacker. Or did you get over there and you were the guy who had to punch <laughs> into the doctor? Uh, well, two things. Yeah, I did punch in the doctor a couple of times. Um, we had a pretty decent attack over there. Brad Williams was there as the, as the mad yep. quick. Um, so he was yeah, a right. half decent bowler, as you know, had. So, um, mad. Yeah. Mad as Gus Snake. Um, there's a few of them over there, actually. Um, but what I didn't realize, and I've had you realize this either, but when they, they bring up these stats, Ross Dundas have these stats for us in the change rooms. Um, so they, they took it, you know, a number of runs per wicket at a ground. Well, this idiot ended up going from what we all thought was the flattest pitch in Adelaide to actually the flattest pitch at, at the Wacker. It was in an era where the, the pitch was so flat, the bounce the bounce yeah. was sort of there, but it was a really flat pitch. I remember a game we played against Tassie. We set them 380 on the last day and ended up being a tie. So they ended up, they ended up nine, eight or nine down for three and chasing on the last day. So that gives you an idea of what the Wacker was like in that era. So, yeah, this idiot decides to go across there for – greener pastures but it wasn't the greener pastures on the pitch unfortunately so but yeah it was good times i really loved it It was a great place to live and good bunch of guys to play with did you cross paths much hats well my my first ever time i was dismissed in Mm. a list day game i know if blocker remembers was for the canberra comets blocker got me out for i think six or eight damien siddons i think caught it and i just remember i was only 17 18 but how, and I'd only played kids cricket, but Blocker was standing at the top of his mark and, and it felt like he was letting the ball go just over my head. Mm. So I never faced uh, met people that tall. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when we had the great Merv Hughes um, yes. in the Canberra Comets. I know you remember uh, that, uh, Block. It was good fun. I do I do remember it, Adam, to answer your question. We did a couple of times. There's a great photo I've got here, actually. Had some I played against in terror of my last, not my last, we played in the Orange League Cup final in Perth. And it was actually the one oh, yeah, Cup on with Steve Wall, which dropped out the Australian side. So he had a point to prove, yeah. unfortunately, for us. Um, it was a phenomenal game. And it was uh, interesting. It was a bit of by-play. A young kid called Doug Bollinger was playing for New South Wales. <laughs> and Justin Langer was convinced. He convinced himself that Dougie didn't have his number. And this all went in at a pre- you know, leading into the final. And so, of course, we've won the toss at the Wacker. It was a 10 o'clock start, not an afternoon start. So we've decided we're going to bat first. On a pitch that's just got a little bit early on. Well, guess who got Justin out? Yep, Doug Bollinger. Uh, we ended up getting, I think he might have straight to just over 200 at the Wacker when when it's yeah. afternoon at the Wacker, it is fill your boots. And these guys, these guys beat us with more than half the overs at them remaining. So not just half the overs remaining. <laughs> so uh, there's a great photo of me 
Well, actually, his nose is in my chest. Um, I think if I remember the photo correctly. <laughs> I'm not that but, tall. Yeah, but anyway, him and I had a bit of a conversation together in the middle of the pitch, and I think John Smoot was umpiring with maybe Steve Davis. I can't remember anyway. So, yeah, I remember that photo. I've got it here at home somewhere. It's, so we definitely played against each other and had a little word to each other, which I'd realised at that stage he likes a bit of confrontation, the young Haddon. But, yeah, I do remember I, the comments I, I, days. Yeah, I do remember the comments days. It was actually a great – I think I saw had to talk about this the other day that it's a pity that they're, they're not in the system because they've brought through some hell of some really good cricketers. Now, we remember those games fondly, actually. And Merv is actually a great mate of Jamie Siddons and whether we are playing them in Canberra, whether they came. In fact, Merv's very last game was against us in Adelaide. Uh, Comets versus South Australia, both Mike Valletta and – uh, Murphy's last game in domestic cricket, yeah, it was one hell of a night, that one. Mm. It, going back to that, I'm not sure whether it was that one day or a Shield game. And I think Stephen and, and Mark were playing, obviously, WA at full strength. And, and going back to Bollinger. And, and I remember Stephen was winding up JL in the in the press <laughs> saying something about, oh, this Bollinger will get you. And he goes, mate, I've faced Waz in Macroom, I've faced Shavin Navas, all the best. I'm not worried about Doug Bollinger. And, and I think he nicked him off. And Doug goes past and goes, shabash, shabash. (laughs) (laughs) We just burst out laughing that Doug could think of something um, that clever to say. But yeah, uh, yeah, it was, it was good time. But yeah, you're right. That game, Tugger had just got dropped. And I think it was our job just to get out there and swing and get out as quick as we can because Tugger wanted to bat. Did he, Blocker, did he at state level have as much to prove and did you have any confrontations with him as well as he did when he was playing for Australia? Like he, he was one of those guys that always felt like he had to kind of make his mark on a contest. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah. That was the great thing about Stephen and, and Mark and the guys that are here. They, they came out with, they were playing, if they were playing for Bankstown or whether they were playing for New South Wales or Australia, they just did what they did. Um, intimidating players to play against. They knew their games inside out. You had to be the better in the contest, obviously, I, you know, a lot of us weren't, weren't up to that standard that those two guys produced. And Tugger in that game, Adam, I think got 80 or 50 balls in that game. Yeah. It was ridiculous. I mean, a young guy called Simon Caddish opened the batting for New South Wales in that game, which his first year, he'd left WA mm-hmm. under controversial circumstances. The coach of our side, they both didn't get along, so he went to New South Wales, which what a wonderful pickup for New South Wales, quite frankly. And we obviously didn't have his services, so he opened the batting in this final. And of course, you know, Simon's got something to prove as well, hasn't he? So, um, and, and then Tugger comes out and blows the game away. He was hitting everyone. I want to talk about it, all of us, all parts. Yeah. I think my four of us went for 40. We had Joe Angel at him. We had Brad Williams. We had, I think we had Matthew Nicholson. Uh, Michael Clark is in Wayne Clark's son, Michael Clark. Yep. So we had a pretty decent lineup. Brad Hogg played that game. I'm not sure Hogg even bowled. Um, it was just, it was all over <laughs> in no time. It was, it was, it was literally, Dig a hole, jump in it, and hope no one sees the game. <laughs> so when Steve Waugh's giving you a bit of tap, is he, like, when he's in that groove, is he actually saying things to you as well, or is he just giving you that stare as if to say, I'm better than you? <laughs> he doesn't need to say anything out of me, so he was just a, an elite player. He just, he just knew yeah. if he was on top of the top of his game and no matter what he, what he could throw at him, he'd be uh, very confident he can overcome it, and that was a special part about him. Very good player, outstanding player. Absolutely. So that's the, the playing career of Paul Blocker Wilson, but it's, it's, we're not even half done here. This, this is the fascinating stuff. <laughs> this and is the fun part. That, that Hads really wants to kind of get in your mind about Blocker is umpire. Okay. And we'll be back in a second on Willow Talk. So Blocker, you've, you've told the, the story of mid-career, um, uh, having that situation as an international cricketer, um, seeing some umpiring that you thought could be better. <laughs> Actually, though, <laughs> did tip you over the edge to go, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go and do this. This looks like fun and a good way to stay involved in cricket. Um, are we on air? Are we, talk- are we on air? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so you PG version. <laughs> yes. No way. That doesn't <laughs> yeah, sell. Yeah, look, I think, I think it always I said uh, previously is that we, we have a – certainly have a culture in Australia of having ex-players take up umpiring. It's something I'd always thought about. Um so in a way, yeah, and in a way, I just felt as though that that was one way of staying involved in the game for a period of time if you're half decent at it. And at the time, Cricket Australia also had the project panel, which is a it was a panel for ex first class players to take up umpiring. Um, so Paul Rifle and Rod Tucker had taken it up 
uh, I think 2002. Um, and so when I came out of the back of my career, took up coaching, it was always in the back of my mind that once the two guys before me got, I suppose, promoted to the national panel, um, there might be some room there for someone who might be interested in umpiring to take it up. So, yeah, I, I think a, a number of factors, but I think the fact that Cricket Australia had this project panel, which was a, a, a fast track system into the in the domestic cricket, uh, was a side why not have a go and see how far I can take it. Can't believe Hads didn't go into that. Uh, <laughs> I've tried. Um, how, how are you uh, perceived in the in the umpiring fraternity? Like uh, as ex players coming in, was were they open arms or was it a bit hostile when you started? Uh, my open arms actually. Um, well, yeah. open arms is probably going a bit too far. But yeah, uh, ultimately, I think from the players' point of view, having someone on the field that had actually tried and done what they're doing or to, uh, and trying to do. Uh, I, it took a lot of weight. I think in a way you got that element of respect from players straight away because yeah, we did. had sort of been there, done that, if you know what I mean. Um, it would very quickly evaporate, though, if you kept making error upon error upon error, and then it doesn't matter how many games you played, you played, it's going to be the same as anybody else. So, But it also took a little bit of extra responsibility on our shoulders to make sure that we did a decent job because if we don't, it would make it very difficult for the next person trying to come onto this list uh, to then ply their trade if we've been horribly unsuccessful. Uh, but if you have a look at it now with Rod's, Rod's only 90 test matches on field. Paul's probably 10 or 15 less than that. Sean Craig came after me and all four of us have done international cricket. So that scheme, if you like, has worked really, really well for, for Cricket Australia from that perspective. So but it does take a little bit of responsibility, but the players, I think in a way, a bit more relaxed having someone out there that had played the game before. What I noticed um, when ex players came in was diffusing the situation um, out in the centre, and and you had some games where you have guys like Stewie Clark and McGiller, and that would push the line. But Brent that, Haddon. no, no, I was very quiet. I was a captain. I had to keep things under control. Hey, hey we'll get to that. Hang on. We'll get to that <laughs> but, confirmation soon. But like that, I I thought that was the the biggest thing that brought. Like you'd let the situation go to the point probably someone who hasn't played the game would jump in a bit too early where you'd let it go till it got to the point where you just say, Oi, mm. enough's enough. And then end. Yeah. It's, it's a perfect question. Cause that, that is the key. Often you talk to people about what are they looking for when they're selecting an umpire? Um, and often you'll hear the X factor or well, we're looking for the X factor. Well, the X factor is what you've just described. To be honest, it's, it's actually game awareness, game sense. Um, but it is allowing, if you like, players have a little bit of rope. At the end of the day, it's out there. Everyone's out there enjoying themselves. It's it's having a bit of fun uh, within reason. So from my point of view, I think Pistol and Rob would say the same thing. Is you're, you're allowing the players to play the game and that's what you're there for. But, yeah, you've got to step in when you have to. And it's reading when things are starting to, if you like, bubble a little bit and just having those conversations privately, whether it's with the captain, whether it's with the player. And we mentioned Doug before. I mean, Doug is just a brilliant, but you know what Doug was like? Doug would yeah. often be on the edge of bubbling over very quickly. Oh, and often it just took yeah. a, you know, walking back to his mark with him saying, mate, you just, you know, have a conversation with him. Mate, you're better than this guy. You know, just, if you get him out, we just get on with the game. So it's just, <laughs> it's good for me if you get a wicket here because we're closer to the end type of thing. So he sort of straight away yeah. got that. Um, so he said, yeah, you're right. He'd come in and get a wicket two balls later and come and thank you for it. Um, and I thank him because he just got a wicket and the game's close to the finishing. So it uh, works both ways. But, yeah, I think it's reading the game's a huge <laughs> part of being reasonably successful, yeah. What about other times, Block? I, I used to watch yourself and Tuck at times walk into square leg and there would be a little bit going on. And out of the corner of your eye, you could see yourself and Tuck laughing, just thinking, this is quite humorous. Yes, I, I would have been involved in this when I was playing. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's... um. Yeah, you know you like your player than some of the players you played with. So it often be reminding yourself, oh, I remember when so and so did this and so you're seeing stuff go on and thought, I don't know why the, I don't know why they're bothering to do this because we've all tried this before and it didn't work when we tried it. So why they're trying it with us? Um, yeah, I know mean, that's the beauty as well, mate, is it being working with people as well on field that actually understand the game as well. I mean uh, we don't want to go back to COVID, but the beauty of COVID is I, I actually got to work with Rod uh, with Ox. And with Pistol, yeah. uh, so Bruce Oxford, Paul Rolfe, Rod Tucker, and David Boone uh, in both summers uh, in Australia when we're uh, and, and just great people, but they know the game inside out, and it just makes life so much 
easier and enjoyable as an umpire when you've got people who just know what they're doing and you have confidence in each other when you're going out there. Well, yeah, that that's um, producer Sam's listed all your your firsts and and then your last in terms of international umpiring first first class match uh, first one dayer, which was actually Hong Kong PNG in Townsville, yes, twenty fourteen. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, was that a higher standard than European cricket league? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, to be fair, it's not very, it's not very hard though. I would have thought to be better than some of the standards in European cricket league. But yes, that was that was better. Actually, I'll tell you, um, Garant Jones was playing for PNG in that game. Um, oh, wow. He was playing. He played a couple of years for PNG to play a World Cup. I think he he was born in yeah. PNG, Garant, um, and he played he played a couple of seasons for them at the back end of his county career. Um, so they that a the, the PNG the PNG boys. They actually play well above their well, their station in regards to their um, what they've got. Um, not yeah. not necessarily skills wise, but in terms of depth, they don't really have a lot. Mm. But they they got a very good side of white ball cricket, PNG and Hong Kong. Often it's expats, etc. So yeah, that was my first two games, and we had a of all places where Graham Lebroy was our match referee for Sri Lanka. Grahimi, and he comes, yeah. He, yeah, he comes Grahimi, which I called him often, which he. Found very amusing. You did. Um, no, I am <laughs> did he know what all. for? He, he does. The Shri- honestly, the Sri Lankan guys, they love they love that twelfth man uh, period of their lives because a lot of those guys, like we've got Ranjit. Well, Metagali's he's a metro free. Yeah. Uh, I've worked with Roshan Mahanama, so he was yeah. metro free for us at the UAE Old T Twenty. Um, all these guys with their names. The Sri Lankan boys love it. They're from that era, that was that, it's like their claim to fame. Um, the fact that yeah. their names were used in a in a twelfth man album. So and in that particular game there was a bomb scare outside the venue there at Townsville, which is now Andrew Simon Stadium. Uh, um, and it was a thing Graham said to me of all the places he said, I come from Sri Lanka and Colombo and the first bomb scare in my life is in Townsville. <laughs> <laughs> On you, Graham. True, true score. Oh dear. Yeah. I reckon most of the Sri Lankans, when you say that, I'm not sure Arjuna Ranatunga down a throat would have been old, uh, overly happy with things, but he wasn't the best friend of Australia going to time. He'd be a great guest on Willow Talk. Hey, just when you say about the, the confrontational things, so he brought up here, I mentioned the list that producer Sam put together here. Your first Aussie test was in COVID because obviously borders a lot harder to get international umpires in. And, and so you got to do an Aussie test. Um, Australia, India, January, 2021 at the SCG. And this is the one, if I'm not mistaken, where Tim Payne was uh, saying a bit behind the stumps. So how, no, how did you deal with that situation? It, because it was a massive story out of it because he, he, he got into a bit of strife after it, I think, when um, before the last test he was, he was told by a few commentators just to tone it down a bit. Maybe not by Bradley Haddon over here, but... Uh... Never be more proud of him. <laughs> <laughs> was, do you remember that as particularly edgy or like confrontational or was it just cricket? Uh, it was actually, as Hads would know, it was blown out of proportion. Um, yeah. it, it, what he said, what he said was caught on stump, Mike, which all the players know, you just got to be very, very wary of And he did it and he had to cop his whack. All the players know that, whether you're playing BBL or whether you're playing national cricket. So from my perspective, ironically, Adam, it was, it was what it was. I, I didn't feel like he was trying to intimidate me or was having a go at me. He was frustrated out of an instance in Melbourne where I was actually TV umpire. They gave him out based on a spike next to the bat with all the technology available. It has to be given out. We all know that. Now, he might not have hit it, but the technology showed that he did. So let's move on with it. And that then got referenced, if you like, in the next game in Sydney. Um, the biggest thing that came out of that, if you remember, was the allegation of uh, racial abuse from the crowd. Mm. That was the yeah. biggest confrontation we had. That's when the game nearly stopped for good. Mohammed um, Siraj, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, Mohammed, so to give you a background, we came off the field the day before and we had management come to us and say, we've had an issue where one of our players or two of our players have been racially uh, vilified on the, uh, from the crowd. And of course, we said, well, where, we, where are they? Whereabouts are they? And they've gone home. And we said, sort of well, you know, as Hads knows, well, if anything happens, let us know. And then we let the referee know straight away. And then all, and it all flows out from there. So again, we just repeated that. So if anything happens, please let us know on the ground so we can get we can get this sorted out so we have we know that it did actually happen that day the day before when they spoke to us that something had been mm. said but again they couldn't find the people but um it, it certainly did happen which is sad but the next day yeah we had the allegation that, that it happened on the fence 
And um, it was one of those situations where it was just on tea time. So we had a situation, guys, that if we, it's a choice that you take them off for tea, but are we going to get them back on the ground? Or do we have the situation, look, how about, how do we get the, how do we get someone down there? Do you know which, which, where they are and who it was? And he, he certainly thought this group of people were the instigators and that's what happened. And they were sort of escorted out of the venue. We got on with the game, but that was quite a interesting moment of someone in my situation, only been doing test cricket briefly, to then have to do with potential um, blow up on the field where we might have to have a game of cricket. So to me, that was the yeah. biggest issue out of that game, not necessarily Tim Payne's behaviour. Tim was actually on the field at the time batting, so he was quite a very good assistance to us to try and calm down the crowd and also talk to the Indian players. But the Indian players were obviously quite upset, as you can imagine, and emotional in that situation. So that was an interesting one to deal with. So not that I ever want to be in that situation again and all the day. Um, but you're talking about Hads. I mean, I, I'll tell the story with that is at the end, not, not Hads, talking about Tim. At the end of the game, uh, Booney, Booney came down to our rooms in the SCG and he had a red face. His face was red with frustration, anger, disappointment. It's like the grandfather saying to the grandson, I'm very disappointed in you. Um, it was a lot of the stuff coming across the stump mic that the match referee was hearing from, from Tim. And you can imagine he's no Tim Payne since he was a little fella in Tasmania. Mm. So Uncle David had a, let's say, had a chat with Tim at the end of that test match at our hotel that we all stayed together in Double Bay. Yeah. Um, I understand that conversation was pretty frank. Um, Justin was a part of that. Um, David gave him, in no uncertain terms, his thoughts and the way he was behaving, the way he should behave as a captain. And we saw, a, I suppose, a more contrite, a more calmer captain in the next game mm. uh, after his chat with Uncle David after that particular test match. So, um, yeah, it was quite an interesting, interesting time. What I've also found interesting with the, the umpiring um, blocker is if you look at cricket, for example, the plays, professionalism has gone through the roof. And it's been the, the same momentum um, with the umpires. But the, the one thing what I would find tough is not being able to umpire a Boxing Day test match, for, for example. Like you, you grow up and everyone's Christmas is in front of the, the TV. And I just think with so much technology around these days and how professional um, umpires are and how they want to do well, it doesn't matter who's in front of it. It must be disappointing that you can't do a Boxing Day test match or, or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I, we were lucky, obviously, in a way with COVID that we were able to do that. COVID, so, yeah. you know, I look back now and I did a Boxing Day test, Australia, England, Ashes just Boxing Day. Um, I never would have got a chance to do that in the modern era. It's been, yep. from that point of view, it was brilliant. I agree. You, you speak to a lot of umpires, though, mate. They don't, we don't necessarily want to umpire our home country um, in test matches based on the fact that it removes any element of anybody, of any sort of bias, whether it's it's never going to be correct, but it's just that perception yep. that you're umpiring mm. your home team. Um, and, just, and, you know, umpires call, for instance, um, I can tell you, I can tell you these guys the stories that the English players a couple of times during that series said, oh, they've had more umpires calls than us. That's, that's how ingrained that the home umpires are doing the home team in another yep. country that, and we could say to them, mate, we're not that good. When it comes to umpire scores, we just call it. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're not that good. We just we try our best. You know, I remember I got Johnny. I gave Johnny Bairstow at MCG um, off Scotty Boland during the six for seven. I was at his end for the for the six wickets, which was one of the great thrills to see a yeah. great bloke get a chance to play and take six wickets at his own ground, which is just awesome. But I gave Johnny out. I know Johnny a long, long time. I gave him out. Ended up in a double umpire's call. It's, as Pistol said, it's aggressive umpiring. Um, I gave him out. <laughs> impact, impact umpire's call, stumps umpire's call. On your bikes, on your out. Um, and, of course, the English boys will let you forget that. You know, well, another umpire's call. And, and then when we stood there, we thought, hang on a minute. Didn't we give you so-and-so out? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Didn't we give someone not out umpire's call? Oh, yeah, it did too, yeah. And we started going through it. We'd realised that Australia was only one or two in front of them. So it's amazing what teams hook onto. And going back to Hads' question, we often don't want to, but it removes all of that. And we can just go into a country, do a game, and we're neutral. Um, and they just realise how bad we are anyway. So, But the beauty is you're really bad in another country. <laughs> <laughs> well, mate, that, that day at the MCG, England were bowled out for about 12, so it didn't really matter what you did. How, 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 how good was it, Adam? I, 
It was all over. Day, <laughs> day three. I thought it. I thought In an I umpire said, sense, from your your, your perspective, oh, absolutely no, right. You, you speak to any umpire who's who's, who's honest, they'll say to you a five day test match lasting just over two days. That is that is gold. That is absolute gold. So we. Uh, so we you're not on a day rate. Right. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a match rate, mate. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so we. I remember at Pistol and I, we got out there the day before we did the uh, venue inspection and. I don't remember it had, but it had a lot of grass on yep. this pitch. Heaps, yep. Oh, and Pistol and I looked at each other and said, this is not going three days. And, we're, and it was right, just like Hobart for the fifth test, a day-night yep. test match under lights in Hobart with 10 mil of grass with a pink ball. I <laughs> thought, this isn't going three days either. And we're How right good. again and finished on, yeah, it's just anyone that's involved in cricket, no matter who they are, if they're honest, they do love a very quick finish. Uh Quick one, Locker, on umpires called DRS. So with uh, officiating, when it comes to sport, emotional um, reactions are the ones that grab grab everyone when it happens. But in the cold light of day, how does the ICC and the umpiring panel and, and people like yourself look at DRS and umpires call? Is it doing the job it is designed to do enough, if you know what I mean? Like... As in uh, it 99% is ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, it is. Um, and I explained to people, and, and Nasser Hussain did a great presentation on this a couple of years ago on air for Sky. Um, at the moment, umpires call is just the border of the stumps. If we remove umpires call, the border of the is no longer the border will be outside the stumps. So if you think about it, only if we remove umpires call and any time hits the stumps, it's out. It only has to be literally the last millimeter of that ball only has to flick the stumps to be out. Now, you might say to Gummer Creek, well, that's out. Yeah, it is. But if you think about it now, those stumps become wider. So the, the, the border around those stumps will become significantly wider, which, as any bowler, would love to have a post call available to Gummer Creek. Batters will be screaming in the first oh. 12 months if it's ever brought in. By the way, it always amuses me, Adam, that the guys that are talking about removing umpires call are all retired players. It's never a current player that's ever asking for it to be removed. <laughs> yeah, they don't have skin um, in the game anymore. Yeah. No, they, it's, it's quite interesting, though, isn't it? Like the Kumo Senga Karas and, oh, let's get rid of it. Well, hang on, you're not playing anymore. Um, it's okay for you. Um, and the other part is the technology, this is a predictive path. So the technology is very, very good, by the way. It's, it's more than 99% accurate. But again, as Hads would know through his time, is that if it's not 100% accurate, if you're removing up high score, it is removing that part of it that's predictive. And the predictive path, when the ball hits the pad, we've got technology showing where we think the ball's going to go. We actually don't know it's going to hit it on that part of the stumps, if that makes sense. So we only know where it's hit the pad. We don't know where it's going to hit the stumps. So the umpire's call now at the edge of the stumps, I think, is, is right. I, I'm, I'm not sure it will change for a while. But I always just bear that in mind that all of a sudden it will become outside the stumps if we remove the umpire's call and all of a sudden that's a different ball game. Uh, and one more, spirit of cricket. So where do you stand on this? Where do umpires stand on the spirit of cricket, which could mean anything anywhere in the world? Um, I, I believe in the spirit of cricket, um, like anybody else, but what I don't, I think Simon Southall uh, said this best last year after what happened at Lords. Um, that I think it's interesting with Spirit of Cricket. People use that and put it out there when something goes against them. Um, yep. That's not what Spirit of Cricket's right. for. Spirit of Cricket's uh, more on behaviour. I think it's a whole element, respect for the officials, respect for the players, respect for each other, etc. It's respect for the stakeholders in the game and the game itself. But ultimately, the Spirit of Cricket um, shouldn't be used as a vehicle or a tool if something goes against you. And then that goes for uh, whether it's domestic cricket, club cricket, whether it's international cricket. Um, when something's done within the laws of the game, it's within the laws of the game. And if you want to change the law, change the law. The irony was what happened to Bearstow last year happened to be at Lords, which is where the laws are designed and, and written. And Simon <laughs> Tapp was on the MC, and Simon's actually on the MCC committee. So, yep. and Simon coming and making that statement would have carried a lot more weight because he's actually on the laws committee. Yeah. Um, and he was right. He's 100% right that you can't use it just because something goes against you. Yeah, so that's my, no, that's my thoughts on the spirit of cricket. 
Hugh Humphreys Plinth Jones, who um, got his membership revoked. He's he's got to realise that he's got a bit of time with his egg and bacon tie at home to uh, to ponder all that. Anyway, um, has yeah, we just got just sorry just on that? I think I yep. think for the two of you as well, you'd agree. Is it? I found, is it only two members that lost their memberships? Is that yes. right? There's yeah. only two. You yeah. can't tell me it was just two. <laughs> it just it must have been far more than two ads. I, I've seen the vision of that. Oh mate. I said to someone, I saw the first bit in the long room, and I know it's yep. like when you walk up the stairs and go to the umpire's room, I said to yeah. someone, is there any vision of the staircase? Is there any vision of them? And I did see that vision yeah. eventually, and it was on for young and old. And how only two people got to, was amazed me, actually. It really did amaze me. So very, very interesting, that. Um, yeah, bit well, of a token I'm gesture. Glad you, yeah, I'm glad you said that, Blocker, because I, I've never, yes, you, you have some banter with the crowds and if. But mm. when you walk through that long room, they're dressed beautifully. They're popping their champagne yep. at Brett Lee at Fine Leg trying to hear. You cop <laughs> as much abuse there mm. as yes. anywhere in the world. Mm. Do, do you cop uh, that as an umpire when you're walking through there as well? Blockers? Yeah. yeah well, I, strange, I was very I lucky. Was my very last test match as an umpire was actually at Lords. So I actually got one of my real, yeah. I suppose my goals in life, you don't get a chance to play it. The fact that I got to umpire it. Um, Yep. I did the Women's World Cup in 2017 as a TV umpire and I also did a test match as a TV umpire. It actually got on field last year. But it wasn't it wasn't a hyped-up game, Adam. It was England versus Ireland. Um, yep. It was actually an official four-day test. It's not an official five-day test. The England-Ireland games are actually an official four-day test at Lords, and it's usually played every four years. But I've got to say it was a pretty sedate affair. That was the, as if you remember, that was the leading game to the Ashes. So I did yeah, that game and then flew home and then the Ashes came came to town and it's fair to say it was a far different atmosphere at England Australia than it was for England <laughs> Ireland. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the one thing we we see a lot now, or it's starting to happen more and more, is franchise players like you see Chris Lynn and, and guys like that knocking back contracts. And you've gone that down that road too, Blocker, with, with umpiring. Yeah, I, I have. Um, it's I think at the moment probably the first one that's done it. Uh, in a way, I suppose I was in the shop window for a while, so I had a rep- uh, not not necessarily a reputation, but I had a relationship with uh, some of the organisers, management of various franchise tournaments. So I got involved in a couple of major league cricket, ILT Twenty, have a WT Ten. So from when I sat down, sort of towards the end of the World Cup last year, I thought that perhaps a way of getting a sort of bit of better balance was going down that player route. Yeah, saying look, I'm not. If if I sign a if I sign a home ball contract and then I'm I'm tied to what they're doing and I can't do the other stuff, uh, but yep. this gave me the freedom, if you like, to stay involved in the game in various ways, including umpiring, uh, whether it's commentating, coaching, mentoring, etc., and and well being. But uh, for me, it gave me more time at home, but also a chance to stay involved. And ironically, out of all of it, I've actually been a specialist TV umpire, uh, which I'm I believe we were myself and Leslie Reefer did it in January were the first two that actually did that ever in the game of cricket where we were a specialist for the tournament, which I know you're smiling. Um, yeah. yeah, I did enjoy it, it's fair to say. Um, I didn't get on field once. All my, you know, all, the, all those Aussie boys and the boys that knew me looked at me and said, are you, good. are you actually going to come on this field? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really and it's really, it's really, really weird. It's really weird in one way because you're so used to going on the ground at some stage. And I only ever went out there look at the pitch just to do something. And then I'd go upstairs and... You do the game and away you go. But it's fair to say it's a bit busier these days than what it used to be. We, we were talking before the show started. To tell us what that looks like, a TV umpire, because it's not just about making decisions now. It's been actually part of the commentary team too, Block. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, they, we started going down there. I think rugby's done it. And a couple of sports have done it. You've got the cameras in the in the uh, TV official's room. Um, you've seen it a few times with the bunker and, and other sports. So. Yeah. They decided to put a camera on our screen, screen in front of me and a camera behind, which with my head on the TV screen, I'm not sure that's an advisable thing to do, but that's what they <laughs> want to do. Um, so as part of that is actually the commentary team we had there was if anything happened in the game and a decision that we had made, you then got asked a couple of hours later, come on air and let's have a chat about it. So whether it was a catch, a low catch, or whether it's a, a drop catch, uh, like I said, our keeper had rolled over and lost the ball, why is that not out? Uh, why was this given out not out? So you'd actually, they could go straight into the straight into the TV umpire's box and get straight from the TV umpire what had happened, why you made that decision and what the law is around that. And in a way, I look at it as you're a bit of an educator for people watching the game, particularly for the first time. 
So I actually really enjoy that aspect where you sort of become an extra commentator on the fly. Uh, but also the role you can play for people watching the game is you can actually educate them on maybe laws and playing yeah. conditions they don't know and why you come to that mm. decision. So I really enjoyed it, mate. We had some bit of fun because I made a decision on a, on a catch the commentators did not agree with. And they came on and I, I could hear them talking about it on air. So I said, I understand all of you don't agree with my decision, but this is the reason why I made it. And it was about the ball was on the floor. There, there's, this, there's this feeling in cricket if someone's got fingers under the ball that their fingers are like that long. Um, <laughs> everyone's, everyone's, <laughs> everyone's fingers are a foot long. So if there's a ball on the ground, there's a ball on the ground. Uh, I'd like to give them all that, but sometimes I can't. That's sort of where the conversation went. But, yeah, I enjoy it, mate. It's, um, it's good fun um, to be umpiring and, and to be able to do it in a rhythm all the time. I found, yeah, it's a great experience. Um, and I did it with 17 games, I think it was, in that tournament and MLC, which we just did in America in uh, July. I did the same thing there as well with Wayne Knights from New Zealand. Uh, block it. We've now got some questions from the Secret Cricket Club. Uh, ah, okay. These are the, the questions from the punters. Here we go. We'll, we'll uh, rattle through them, shall we? We've kept you long enough. Uh, Matt asks, do you have a mental process or sequence before each delivery? Uh, yes, I, d- I did until uh, uh, all that no ball came in. I used to say to myself, football. So what's the foot? What's the ball? So it sort of becomes a mantra that I talk to myself. You're making sure you're ready to go. Still. And then the bowlers next year, football, and you sort of bring the ball into focus. So that was my routine all the time. So uh, it worked pretty well. We've got one from Zach. Funniest interaction with player? Funniest interaction. Uh, funniest interaction with players on the field. Doug Bollinger always comes to the top of my list uh, <laughs> oh, for, very, for various <laughs> reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and I reckon, one, I'll tell you, one, one of them was, I was in my first year on the national panel, I reckon. I was with Mick Martell. I am in SCG, New South Wales, Tassie. And he just uh, just innocently come up to me and said, Blocker, I'm, I'm fascinated. Were you always a nuffy? Just to be <laughs> becoming an umpire. <laughs> uh, oh, well, no, but now you mention it, maybe it could be. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's you know, like the whacker where it's you, anything you say, the whackers, you know, it, you know it, it just echoes around the stadium. Uh, you know yeah. what Doug's like. He gets bored. He gets down by <laughs> oh. squealing. I oh, just hit him in the head, please. Um, you know, <laughs> he just random stuff like that. Um, I remember one game, New South Wales WA um, in Perth, and I'd given Adam Voges out and revoked my signal straight away. It had actually yeah. come off a young Josh Hazelwood, hit his thigh guard through to the keeper. I gave it out. Oh, it's not out. It was me. Anyway. Hey, it, was you. it was you. There you go. And, of course, yeah. you remember what happened later on. I gave... I think Stewie Clark was bowling, maybe, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, there was a big appeal from you guys, and there was dead silence. And then all of a sudden, Doug gets finally, you've got time to change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what were you saying under time. your breath, Hats? No, he was, he was right. Oh, was he? When the bogus, we went, oh, how's that out? And then the right decision was made. Uh, but yeah. it's That was my Clark first game, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Safraz would have used it as his advantage. Though. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Isaac's got a question, Blocker. Any calls you regret it? Uh, yeah, I mentioned this in an interview uh, a couple of months ago. I made a stinker of a decision in a World Cup qualifier in Zimbabwe. I gave Richie Barrington out from Scotland off uh, Ashley Nurse. Um, and that was the qualifying tournament to get into the World Cup, which is quite lucrative to get into the World Cup. Um, and what ended up happening in this game was about half an hour later, a massive storm came across, washed out the rest of the game, and they lost on Duckworth Lewis by five runs. Um, mm. <laughs> and I, and my, my, by the way, my decision didn't cost them, but they like that's been sold that way for the last six years. But I'd love yeah, to have that decision back, which is so it never gets talked about. You know what I mean? Fair enough. One rule that you'd change, blocker. As an uh, uh, obviously, mate. Uh, bounces should be more than two. You should let have two more than two above shoulder. I oh, just, yeah, you know, let's let's allow as many yep. bounces as you like. Um, uh, that's what I like to see changed. And the other one I like to see is it's um, which the batters would hate is remove this pitching outside leg business. So that would that would change the oh. game. Mm. Yes, it would. That one from Eden. Uh, Jake has got a question. This is this is a good one. Any standout characters when appealing? 
Oh, Nathan Lyon's very theatrical these days. He's he's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Um, appealing. Uh, Adil Rashid's another one. Most of the spinners, to be honest, mate. I mean, most of the spinners have got their own. Rashid cards. well, with Rash, you never quite know whether he's going to look at you or whether he's just running off to... Uh, running off the point, assuming you're going to give it that LBW, which is normally... Do you hate that as an umpire? Uh, as an assumption made sure. by a bowler? Yeah, you'd like, you'd like them to look at you when they're, they're actually appealing. <laughs> um, it's a bit like with a batter you don't really like, you give out and make sure they're looking at you when you put your finger up. I've done that a few times. I've waited. Look at me. <laughs> Bang. Out. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Johnny Best, uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I actually get along with Johnny all right, but um, I tend to give him out a bit too, so he doesn't like me very much when I'm thinking the end of the day. But, mm. uh, good one. Uh, Jamison asks, does the third umpire's outfit match or can they do it in thongs or just bare feet? <laughs> <laughs> you uh, have to wear the well, full you can. shoes. Uh, you generally got the same shirt on, same pants, but yes, you could wear uh, yeah, thongs, slides, um, yeah, slippers, if you like, and most people don't. Um, I did it in no. Major League Cricket when we are in Texas in 40-degree heat. I actually wore shorts. Uh, I had the, I had the, uh, the, the, obviously the proper top on, but I had shorts yes, on yeah. because it was seriously in the room. It was baking. Um, so that was a, more of a, uh, a comfort level, but generally got the same uniform on. I'll let Hads ask this yeah. next one. It's from Nathan. It's it's just made for Hads. Yeah, I like Nathan. What What's the best sled you've heard, Block? <laughs> The best oh, sledge I've heard. Mm. Oh, um, well, uh, the best sledges I've heard are more, are more to do when we played, mate. Because I've got to say, when we, on a, yeah. I've umpired, I haven't heard too many that I've actually thought that. And, and a lot of it's not so it's nice these days, but everyone knows each other so well that you don't tend to get the funny stuff. I mean, uh, all the stuff about you know yeah. it's. <laughs> you know, it's it's the yeah. it's the it's, you know have a have a look at the you know, the old. When you get the sledging, the ball gets out of the park. You know, it's, it's that red thing where you know it looks like go and fetch it. You know, but it's never been really. Got to be honest with you, I haven't got a story for you. I haven't heard of sledges an umpire. I thought, you know, well, that's pretty good. The only one I've seen is players like um, Mitch Marsh, for instance. Mitch got um, got hit in the nether regions in a BBL game, and the Marsh families, you know, aren't in a way they're not the shrewdest cats at times. Um, so he's standing there getting treatment and everything else, and then all of a sudden he pipes up the, the umpire and I. Why is that not above the waist? Well, <laughs> where did it hit you? <laughs> um, yeah. So it's more it's more reactions by players than sledging, to be honest. So yeah, oh, brilliant, mm. brilliant. Lin- Linford, have you ever given a batsman out due to man cat? No, uh, n- not not on the field or. In the TV umpires box, no, mm. no. And there's only been a couple. You... There's only been a couple of attempts. I think um, public ones. I think Adam Zampa tried a couple of years ago out of frustration, but he'd already pretty much bowled it before he started to take the bars off in the BBL game. But there hasn't been too many of them actually, mate. To be honest, so which is a good thing. Mm. Um, it's there for a reason. That law, um, but it basically stop that as cheating. Let's be honest. <laughs> To taking advantage of from the non-strikers there. But no, I haven't seen it. Um, hasn't been attempted in games I've done, Touchwood. So hopefully that remains the same. Yeah, and Stuart asks, with the modern-day player umpiring, were, were you ever nervous about getting hit from a straight drive? Uh, only a couple of times, mate, to be honest. And I'm a pretty big target, as you know. Uh, so I'm bigger than most. Um, no, but... Certain plays, yes. So let's say David Warner uh, hitting straight, a uh, Chris Gale, oh yeah, uh, and his pomp hitting straight is just it's the next second you're gone. Um, those sort of plays you've got in the game, you and I have done it, where I've taken a couple of steps further back, <laughs> um, just just in case. And particularly now, the way the game is with auto no ball, you can actually do that because the TV yeah. umpire is looking at the front foot anyway. So uh, it's a, a less of an issue now, I reckon. If Umpires are smarter about it. And last one, mate, but definitely not least. I've been itching to ask this one all podcast. Did you ever have to ask Hads to cool it? Oh, never. Uh, no, I never did. What? No, I never did. No. Never. No, and, I, and I see, I've seen, I played against him at the back end of my career and when he started, and so I sort of knew, and I obviously said that photo I've got at home with us, as I said, his nose on my chest. Um, 
in a game at the Wacker. It was the final, actually. I think it might have been the final we yeah. spoke about when Dougie got um, yep. just announced and it, you, you got his towel us up. But no, man, in fact, when he was captain, I, I think it's like he it comes with all that responsibility as a leader that they become, it's fun enough to become really good to work with. And I'm not saying that because he's in the studio. Um, but mm. I even talk to people like Cameron White, for instance, there. Cameron White. Uh, but he became captain as a youngster anyway, and he was difficult to deal with, let's say, to start with. But towards the back end of his career, fantastic. Um, I'd say the majority of the time I I worked with Victoria particularly, uh, they had a lot of, sort of senior heads. So it's interesting we look through some of those generations that guys that then took on captaincy and had that responsibility were very, very good to deal with. That's the reason why they had the job. Um, so I've got to say, sorry, mate, I can't help you there, Adam. He, he was actually okay right to answer. deal with, mate. So. No, I've just all of New Zealand have just said you're a complete bullshit artist because they think that <laughs> just didn't shut up out there. But anyway, that's well, the way it goes. I'll, I'll take just, your word for a blocker. Maybe, he maybe just saved it for the national scene where he wasn't <laughs> captain at him. So um, I'm sure I'm yeah. sure that I'm yeah, sure the World Cup final and might have had a few things to say about him. But that's okay. Yeah. He didn't get reprimanded there. He didn't get a chance to <laughs> uh, say much to his main target because he was back in the sheds after three balls. Uh, Paul Wilson, really appreciate. Um, the chat today and your time on Willow Talk and uh, enlightening us on, on your career, firstly as a cricketer and then as an umpire and, and taking us into the world of umpiring. It's been fascinating, mate. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. I feel honoured uh, being asked. So um, yeah. thank you very much. All class. Thanks, Block. Good stuff. Uh, that was Willow Talk this week. We'll be back with plenty more real soon. Yeah, thanks for watching the Willow Talk podcast on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't have to miss an episode wherever you are. And while you're at it, check out these videos up here. They're mostly good.